Good morning, and welcome to the Church in the Gardens. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, first up, the music director, Sonny Nabel, is not actually here or even in this country, but he has pre-recorded the music. So you will see and hear him, but he isn't actually here. And also there's a repercussion for the people attending live. We may lose the video in here, but the sound will remain. All of you online should be fine for both video and audio. Um, please pray for all who are sick and healing, those who are grieving and hurting, for Carolyn Yesherian's father-in-law recovering from heart surgery, for Cindy Herendine's brother-in-law, Anthony Sapienza, recovering from surgery, and my sister Patty recovering from open-heart surgery. And anyone else who needs prayers out there, please send them to God now. Without further ado, I want to introduce our leader today of our service, our very own seminarian, Andrew Mowat, that is the proper way to say his name, and he is attending Union Theological Seminary in New York. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Diane. Welcome to church, everyone, both here and following on Zoom. July the 25th is an interesting day, as it seems every known ordained minister is on holiday or unavailable. So you get yours truly here, your local seminarian, to lead worship. And I'd like to say thank you to the deacons for trusting in me, and also thank you to the local UCC who gave me the endorsement to fill the spot fill this spot. So thank you. And now let us enter into worship with our opening prayer. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for waking us up this morning and giving us yet another beautiful summer's day. We are blessed to come to the sanctuary and to share in the glory and honor of your name. In this time of worship, remind us of your greatness and merciful deeds. Show us how we may continue to walk in your way. Bless our time here together, dear God, so we may experience the presence of your mighty Holy Spirit. In your name, we pray, amen. Please join me in the call to worship. God has searched us and knows us. God knows when we sit down and when we rise up. God is acquainted with all our ways. God's hand is ever available to guide us. We cannot escape from God's spirit. There is nowhere to flee from God's presence. God illuminates the way before us with grace and light. Amen. Now, please rise to the singing hymn. Oh, 
sung by flaming tongues above. Praise to Mount I'm fixed upon us, Mount of God's unchanging love. Now hear the prayer of confession. When we run away from our problems, we discover that we cannot run away from ourselves. Yet God is present with us to hear our confession and offer forgiveness. God brings back, brings us back to face what we have left behind in order that we may claim the promise of reconciliation and wholeness. Amen. Praise our God who forgives and restores. Give thanks for the inheritance that is ours in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, not death or life, not angels or rulers, not things present or things to come, not heights or depth no earthly power or anything in all creation can take away God's abiding concern and care for each one of us. Praise God. And as is the custom after the assurance of pardon here, we pass the peace of Christ. And for those on Zoom and here in sanctuary, 
our tradition is to use the peace sign. And we say, the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Peace of Christ. Listen for the word of the Lord from Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And the second reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verses 1 through 21. The birth of Isaac. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Hagar and Ishmael sent away. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son, Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named after you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with her child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. 
Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well then, good morning, Church in the Gardens. It is an honor to be asked to preach to you again this morning. I'm humbled by the task, but I am grateful for this unique opportunity. My selected text today is taken from Genesis, verses 1 through 21. This scripture covered the expulsion of the servant Hagar and her son Ishmael from Abraham's family amidst the birth of Isaac as the chosen son. As we recall, Genesis is Bereshit, the beginning as translated in Hebrew. As with the start of most things in this book, events began well enough with God's actions Unfortunately, whenever humans started making their own decisions outside of God's guidance, things got messy and traumatic quickly. Genesis 21 verses 1 through 21 is no exception. Although God's chosen people were founded in the miracle birth of Isaac, others like Hagar and Ishmael were cast out of that promise. However, even in their moments of duress and anguish, the God of other was still with them. And especially today, we are reminded that God loves and supports all of us in troubling times and offers a constant source of hope for those in a state of need. First though, how many of you recall picture day in elementary school? Hmm, think back. Have you got it, Hal? All right. Yes, I certainly do as well. You might say that I look forward to it with a real sense of dread. Yes, I am the son of a Scottish minister who lived in a rural village. Most of my clothes then were hand-me-downs found in the thrift shops and the charity bins. Well, all the other kids in town arrived on picture day dressed to the nines. When it came time for the group snap, I was inevitably and always made to stand in the back to the side, maybe next to the teacher. My face would be seen, not much else. In the final print, I could say I was there but not really visible, certainly not welcomed. I think we can say that the servant Hagar and her son Ishmael were in the same situation in our text. 
They both had become unwanted and unneeded in the bigger picture of the chosen people. In our verses, the great promise of God had been fulfilled to Abraham. The barren Sarah was given the miracle child, Isaac. Sarah and Abraham both witnessed God's ability to accomplish anything. However, it was done in God's time, not theirs. Of course, great joy was celebrated in Genesis 21, verse 8, as Isaac was weaned as a toddler. Child mortality in those days was quite high. For a baby to live past two years was a major event to be observed. But there definitely was a problem behind the scenes. What about the firstborn son, Ishmael? Was he not already the chosen heir by the rules of the day? Yes, through impatience and human design, about 14 years prior, 86-year-old Abraham sired an heir via the Egyptian servant Hagar at the command of the then barren Sarah. It was read in Genesis 16. Of course, it is not registered if Hagar was ever consulted on the idea or if she even was given a choice in the matter. I'm guessing that Hagar did not offer much pushback either. A foreign slave was already on the outside looking in. The only thing that mattered in the equation was that Hagar was young enough to bear a child and Sarah decided that Hagar would be the surrogate. Nothing more needed to be discussed, it seemed. Nonetheless, the boy Ishmael was born of the union and an earthly heir was finally produced. However, there was tension between Hagar and Sarah in those days. While still pregnant, Hagar had run away from Sarah's cruelty Genesis 16. However, Hagar returned to the domestic hostility. I have wondered why such a command would have been given by God, knowing the toxic circumstances. By the time of Genesis 21, verse 10, Sarah's wrath toward Hagar and Ishmael had reached a pinnacle. In fact, Sarah had witnessed the teenager Ishmael mocking his younger sibling Isaac on weaning day. Although such boyish behavior sounds harmless to our ears, Sarah was outraged. She clearly took offense to Ishmael's banter with his brother. Little fun and games between the kids should be deemed as harmless, right? I remind you now that Isaac's name in Hebrew meant he laughs. Despite the likely innocent nature of the act, it was no laughing matter for either Ishmael or Hagar. The direct order from Sarah was final. Cast them out. This was a very dire demand. Yet it seemed not much resistance was offered by Abraham. Abraham had nothing further to say, gave no rebuttal. 
To mention a comic book reference here, I think that Abraham folded faster than Superman on laundry day. Yeah, how about that? Yes, this being the same Abraham who debated God earlier to spare Sodom from annihilation. Yet nothing for his own flesh and blood or Hagar. So, in Genesis 21, verse 14, Abraham released Hagar from her servitude and completely disowned Ishmael. He sent them out into the wasteland with a meager supply of bread and water. There was no offer of goodbye or even an explanation of why this had to be done. Justin, on your way then. And what about the devastating state of mind for Ishmael or Hagar? I think we can all collectively fill in the blank there. Then things thereafter became miserable for mother and son. Food and water ran out quickly as they wandered aimlessly in the desert. Then they finally gave up. Hagar resigned herself and Ishmael to the fate of death. With her last bit of energy, she did as we all likely would do. She sat down opposite her dying son, and she wept. However, we know Yahweh was the God of other. Despite Hagar being a foreigner and forsaken, God still heard her cry in the desert, and God responded. Yes, God actually spoke to Hagar via an angel. It was written that God interjected and acknowledged an invisible person in dire circumstances. In fact, God revealed to Hagar a nearby well for both of them to drink. Even in the height of hopelessness, Hagar and Ishmael were given a means to survive in a place of void. At this moment, I will remind you that Ishmael's name in Hebrew translates to God has heard. God's intervention indicated that even the others who were unwanted and unneeded were remembered and cared for. Ishmael was still the son of Abraham and one of God's children. God promised a great nation would derive from him too. Of course, it would be done in the wasteland and not in the land of milk and honey. Never would life go easy for either mother or son, but God gave them strength and the means to persevere. In fact, even today, we witness the struggles of modern Hagars and Ishmaels in our midst. In shocking reality, over the last many years, we have watched Central American families cast out of their troubled nations, fleeing corruption, and violence. 
they ventured with God's guidance across the dangerous wilderness, seeking hope and better lives here. Upon arrival at our southern borders, they were met by ICE agents who ostracized and criminalized them. The frightened and shocked Ishmaels were separated from their mothers and thrown into steel cages. The powerless were incarcerated strictly for seeking asylum. However, even in those dark moments, God was with them. Domestically, there are dual pandemics still in the United States as I speak. The first being COVID-19. It has disproportionately affected low and middle income families of color. According to the latest data from the CDC, Latino, Black, and Indigenous Americans have all suffered deaths double or more than that of white Americans. 600,000 of our neighbors were gone in the last 15 months. Yes, the vaccine is here but not in time for some. Yet, God remembers all those who were lost and is with the survivors and their families. The other more insidious pandemic is the vile disease of systematic racism in our society. How many thousands have succumbed to this evil pestilence? There are many who are named and hundred more who remain unnamed. They all deserve so much better from this country. And these ridiculous and heartbreaking stories of shootings that are plaguing our community and city today. I do not understand America's obsession with firearms. God has clearly told us that thou shall not kill. Why does it fall on deaf? Ears. Yes, every day we see modern Hagars and Ishmaels around us in jeopardy. God has called each of us here to seek out and find those under duress, seen and unseen. I have said this before, and I will say it again. I believe that the church in the gardens is an incubator of hope. We here have all consolidated our voices for change and used our donations, our time, and our volunteer work to make an impact in our community and our city. But our work continues. We are God's agents of change. Our purpose here and now is to go out further into the wilderness and discover those still in the need of hope. We behold 
the vision and the calling to make mercy tangible. We must ensure that these values have a rightful place during these troubling times. We believe that empathy and kindness are of an unlimited abundance, just like the bottomless well that God revealed to Hagar in the desert. So now, more than ever, this is our moment, Church in the Gardens. God is with us and those without a voice. Let us now venture out into the wilderness so that all the Hagars and Ishmaels can hear God's assurance of hope. Amen. Now, please rise to the singing of our second hymn, He Leadeth Me. Hold on, temporary setback. Our Rama is on top of it. Victory is won. 
Thank you, Electronic Sunny. That is my favorite hymn. Please be, be, please be seated. And now let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving and powerful God, your Holy Spirit and universal love unites all your children as your humble servants. We are called to act and serve as your agents in this difficult and troubled world. We pray for those here today and those worshiping via Zoom. We thank you for all the blessings that you have given us today and every day. Your everlasting care surrounds us with goodness and hope as we live in your light and guidance. We pray in gratitude for all that we are and for all that you have given us via gifts of truth, justice, mercy, forgiveness, and empathy. We continue to pray for love, stability, togetherness amongst all your people. There are those within the sound of my voice who are troubled and concerned, dear God. They bear heavy burdens of the heart and the mind. Hear their unspoken pleas for comfort and ease their anxieties. Reveal to them your overwhelming compassion. For those who carry wounds of the physical, emotional, and spiritual type, soothe their pain and offer them permanent and lasting healing. There are many who are lost in the wilderness right now. Guide them back to the ways of compassion. We ourselves go out into the fray every day. Protect us and encourage us as we seek out those in the need of hope. We pray for the divisions and hostilities in our community and our city. Install in each of your children a desire to lay down their aggressions and seek a peaceful means to resolve differences. Bring forth decency and common sense, which seems uncommon as of late. We pray for the search committee. May they find the right shepherd for this flock. We pray for our local and national leaders Install within them the guidance and the clarity necessary to heal what divides us as citizens and human beings. Let us embrace a new sense of wholeness by seeing the humanity in others to realize we are more alike than different. We humbly and sincerely ask that you guide us forward in grace. As we pray the words that Jesus taught us to say together in prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive 
our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's the time in our worship service where we share in the giving of our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. Our Diane will tell you the four ways in which you may give back to your church. They are the usual four ways, but if you haven't heard them in a while, you can mail a check in to the church. You can set up bill payment through your bank and have the bank send the check to the church. You can use PayPal, just go to the website and click on the donate link on the upper right. Or if you're here in person, you can use the touchless offering plate at the back of the sanctuary, as Samantha did, thank you.
in Genesis depicting humans who rely on their own wants and desires instead of trusting you and make a big mess of things, resulting in a mother and her child in exile and near death. Yet you come to the rescue in spite of human sin and save Hagar and Ishmael and also promise Ishmael many descendants just like Isaac. When we sin, when we fail, when we make self-centered decisions that hurt others and ourselves, we can still cry out to you, God, and you hear our cries, our hope in the wilderness still. We bring our lives to you to be blessed, to be shared, to be given. These offerings are a token of our appreciation and our mission. Transform them into your love and your ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. the benediction church in the gardens as we go out into the wilderness to do God's work may God bless you and keep you may God's face shine upon you be gracious to you and give you peace amen <laughs> Thank you.